I'm Richard Lamana. I'm the Academic Assessment Manager at Bronx Community College. I've been there about three years. Um, I was the first person there hired for assessment. Before then, assessment was kind of here and there, and it was not centralized, and there was no one really in charge of it. So uh, it's been an interesting three years. Um, the good news about assessment is that assessment is taking place a little bit. The bad news about assessment is that assessment is taking place just a little bit. Um, any of you who have worked uh, to try to get people to do assessments who are not used to doing it will understand what a struggle it is, uh, beginning with trying to get faculty to understand assessments. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Let's, as we talk, let's just keep in mind that they, we, we're talking about two types of assessment. We're talking about direct assessment, which, which measures student performance, and then we're also talking about indirect assessment, which measures uh, more student attitudes, and these are done usually by surveys. Um, assessment in general, from what I heard yesterday in our roundtable discussion, and uh, what I hear at the CUNY Assessment Council, which, where all the college's assessment people gather, is that uh, it continues to challenge, but it's making inroads in many colleges. Uh, I know this from the work I do and uh, from the people I work with on campus. Uh, for example, on my campus, we have two or three departments who have really seized on assessment. They've learned to streamline it. To, uh, to work as a group and to do great things with it. Um, we have several departments that are still sort of here and there. They haven't really gotten their feet wet. And then we have a few departments that know very little about it. That may not, that, that may not be true of your campuses, but I, it is true. Okay, good. All right, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> no, we never tell names. Um, the three basic challenges to assessment are setting up the structure, the compliance, and the consistency. I was at the large um, assessment conference in Indianapolis last year. I don't know if any of you have been to that. And then I was at it a few years ago. And the same statement is always made. Uh, someone, the, the keynote speaker, will say, how many of you have been doing assessments? And 95% of 1,200 people will raise their hands. And uh, then she said, and how many of you have looped the results into the next iteration of the course? And 14 people will raise their hands. <laughs> assessment is being done, but unfortunately, it's being put in uh, electronic portfolios, it's being put in file cabinets, and, uh, and they, there it remains for many colleges. Um, this I know uh, pets is technology, so let, let me just say a little bit about technology. Uh, there are a few colleges, yesterday we heard from Lehman and we heard from Cookstown Community College that they have developed data management and gathering. Uh, this, of course, is important when you have a large school and you have all kinds of assessments coming in from different, from courses, from programs, and from institutional sources. Uh, one, one thing we talk about sometimes at the CUNY Assessment Council meeting is not to get software until you're ready for it that you may be putting the horse before the cart. Right now, my assessment, as I do it, is, is rather primitive. I have it all mostly in Word documents, a little bit in Excel, and I keep them on my desktop. We're not ready yet at BCC to move into getting a management program. And from what I heard yesterday, I'm, I'm, many people are not ready for that, although Every day I get emails from TAC, uh, TaskStream, and all kinds of people who want to come and visit the college. 
Um, most activity, from uh, what I heard yesterday, is going on in indirect assessment. Several colleges have developed extensive indirect measurements, meaning that they are using surveys and other ways in which to find out what students uh, have learned. Of course, there's a problem there, because after you have a course, after you've taught a course, and you cannot always rely on what the student says he or she has learned. You need really direct measurement. Uh, still, surveys can be helpful, and many of the uh, HETS colleges, it seems, are using uh, the NESI, the SESI, and then developing their own survey tools to reach out to students and see what they're doing. Please keep in mind that this is not outcomes-based. Outcomes-based is when you have data that you've collected from developing assessment tools and benchmarks, and you now have the data in your hand, which is quite different than finding out what students think on surveys. Um, direct assessment, and this was kind of new for me, um, I learned yesterday, is being done um, often through the value rubrics. Where is Ross? Yes. Uh, the AAC and U value rubrics, I, I didn't realize how extensive they are being used at different colleges. At my college, we are trying to get <coughs> faculty to develop their own outcomes, and then we, uh, I, and they work together to develop rubrics specifically there. Because when I deal with faculty, I tell them that faculty, that assessment is a faculty-devised, faculty-driven, faculty-interpreted event. And the last thing faculty want to hear is that something is coming from above. But the, uh, the value rubrics uh, give us good ideas, and who knows, maybe we'll start working with them. Um, E-portfolios. This again, there's, there's uh, quite a bit being done in some areas, and there's, there's nothing being done in some other areas. I think we all know that LaGuardia Community College is a national leader uh, in, assess, in uh, using e-portfolios just about for everything, and, uh, including assessment. I could speak from Bronx Community College. We are now using e-portfolios, and we are developing direct assessment from student work from e-portfolios for our FYS program. Last week, I, I brought a team up to the AACNU Con, uh, Institute in uh, Vermont, and that's what we worked on, uh, was developing the FYS course. Um, just to review the assessment process in, in, in a few words. We establish outcomes and benchmarks. We test or evaluate how well these benchmarks are being met by using tools we developed. We collect data and we interpret it. And then we make curriculum or other changes as needed. And those who are familiar with assessment, you've seen the pictures of the assessment loop. It's a continuous, nonstop process. And when we give my, I have a very small team at BCC, a, a few faculty members who have a little bit of release time. We, we say over and over again in these workshops, the whole point is the student. It all gets focused on what can we do for the student next to make sure that he or she uh, is, is reaching the outcomes and he or she will leave the college with skills in our gen ed proficiencies that will take him or her into a four-year college or into a career track. Um, just to give you some ideas of what we've been doing at BCC, and I, I thought this might be helpful for everyone, uh, Albert Robinson and I developed four hats, I guess about a year and a, a year and a half ago, a Blackboard course, and I believe it is, is being used by HETS. We then took the course, and I revised it and edited it, and I made it local for Bronx Community College. 
So for example, I offer a Blackboard course probably four times a year. And it, it, it's the Blackboard course that we originally worked with with PETS, uh, revised of course. And um, for example, I have 15 people in the course this summer, faculty and staff. Uh, I promote the course. Uh, there are nine units in this Blackboard course. There's, there's no grade or anything. I'm always available and Albert's always available for help and uh, we give them a nice beautiful certificate at the end and we're hoping to start the next generation of people who can uh, who know assessment and who come into the college uh, eager and ready especially beginning faculty because those of us who are older faculty members i i taught 18 years i was a tenured full professor for many years uh, I never learned about assessment until I became the chair of the department. I, hadn't, I, I, I didn't even know what it was until years later when uh, I was working at a private college and the, uh, the vice president said to me, we're going to start doing assessment. And then I, I got immersed into it. Um, that's still one of the problems with some faculty is they, that they don't understand that assessment is has some overlaps with grading, but it's, it's very different than grading. They, they serve two different purposes. Um, another thing we're doing at BCC is I've, be, I've started a newsletter, and it's called Assessment Matters. And what I'm doing in, basically is highlighting those departments that are doing assessment and doing it well. Uh, I hope to get the uh, newsletter larger. Right now it's just two sides, but it's beautifully done. We come out, I bring it out four times a year. I'm doing all the writing right now, but I hope to get more faculty uh, involved in it and writing in it. Also, I'm starting to write articles with some of the departments that are performing assessment. So we try to celebrate our successes and those who are doing things and not focus in on those department chairs who when they see me in the hall go the other way because they're afraid I'm going to ask them something. Um, um, pathways. There was a discussion about pathways and those of us in CUNY know about pathways. While we were developing assessments at BCC and all the other colleges, the, the uh, CUNY decided we were going to have a a transfer program called Pathways, but it was going to be more than that. The core and the next 15 credits in basically gen ed courses would have learning outcomes. One of the problems when faculty sat down, not just at my campus, but other campuses, to discuss these courses were, some of them didn't know what learning outcomes were. They, they thought that what the course is aiming for is the learning outcome which gives an idea of how, how much the need is there to develop outcomes and to develop the idea of outcomes. Uh, pathways is probably going to change a lot of things. I, I imagine at some point CUNY is going to say you have these outcomes and CUNY picked the outcomes for all the courses, <laughs> at least three in what they call the core and the bucket courses. And it's going to be a matter of time before CUNY says, we want these outcomes assessed. That, that's my guess anyway. And that, I think, will change how we're doing assessments. Um, HETS. Uh, we want to continue a partnership with HETS. I want to thank Alfredo, and especially you Belgies who whom I've exchanged 50 emails with in the last couple of years. Um, it, it's a great organization. It gives us a place to sort of come together and discuss these issues. I don't have much more than that. Um, but let's see. We'll, shall we ask some questions? And maybe we can get a discussion going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how are you integrating the whole <coughs> assessment process to curricular mapping on the profile of your graduates, which is what each institution wants to produce 
with the branding of how our graduates look like. Right. So those are the things that we need to assess. It's not every competency or every skill. Professors do that in their courses. It's that trademark that will represent a graduate from Lehman, from Sagrado, from Inter, from you know, Fairfield, whichever. And well, one, one thing, thing we did at Bronx was with this small team I have, we developed four integrated um, workshops that dovetail off each other. So, for example, in the second workshop, we spent three hours on curriculum mapping for the programs. Mm -hmm. And we tried to get all the program directors and some chairs in to settle on a curriculum mapping so we see what skills are being emphasized, reiterated, and then assessed. Uh, and some departments have continued with that. There's still and I think this is probably true of all colleges, there's still some uh, res resistance, and we can't get everyone to buy in. But now, for example, at our college, we have one program, an arts program, who has done a great job curriculum mapping, and we use that as an example, and we try to get other programs to take it on. We aren't at the point yet where we have enough of this going on that I could say that I could give you solid answers to your questions. But we are trying, and uh, we are making some headway. Yeah, I think you're talking maybe about mapping against institutional learning goals, oh, uh, the, which, yeah. which would distinguish one graduate from another, and those are the learning goals that would be from the general education right. program, exactly. but beyond that, from the school's mission or vision yeah. statement, yeah. those goals that are often ignored, but do need to be integrated in a comprehensive understanding of yes. mapping of where the curriculum lines up. You know, because we're a community college, we are very focused on our general <coughs> proficiencies. Yeah and the gen ed proficiencies, we align them, or we help faculty align them with course content, so, or program content. So uh, a professor, for example, may be teaching biology, <coughs> but at the same time, the skill that's being demonstrated is critical thinking, uh, the scientific method, and perhaps communication. And so we build we don't have what we call gen ed courses. We build the gen ed proficiencies across the courses mm -hmm. and the programs. I, I was going to comment. No, when you talk about the mapping, you're talking about the three components of, of, that, of that profile. It's the gen ed component, the, the department or broad field. Of which oh, I see what you're And then the major. Oh, the programs <coughs> have to have the three components because every program has three components. Right, but you, we, it's important to talk about the mission too. Oh, yeah. And the vision. And the advantage there is that you can talk about uh, units other than academic affairs. I mean, oh, yeah. student affairs Obviously. is an important Everything. part of an educational mission. Oh, yeah. And when you broaden yeah. the goals, when you talk about institutional goals, you provide explicit room for student affairs and other units, yeah. perhaps. And, and the value of this whole scheme of mine is that both faculty and non-faculty begin to see how every piece fits. It's not just curricular. Right. It's co-curricular, it's extracurricular, yes. it's student life, it's all sorts of engagement that make up that construct of assessment. Right. So that's what hopefully is intended that we all come to realize how these elements integrate into making students succeed. Exactly. They're not isolated components. On the academic side, what we do is we take the institutional goals, we take the gen ed proficiencies that were voted in by the faculty senate in 2004, and we use them to structure, um, and we embed them, let's say, in our programs to make sure that all seven gen ed proficiencies are touched by each student. And then the gen ed proficiencies, then from the programs, they go into the courses. And then we have, of course, the student services side, which is also problematic in a different way. Yes? I have a, you mentioned in terms of assessment, the portfolios, the portfolios that you said, some people are really immersed into them, some other ones, like our institution, where just 
far away as possible. And the reason behind it for it, it's a very comprehensive assessment uh, instrument. Uh, and if you don't use it twice, it can just end up being uh, just a repository for documents right. and all that. I think it's something for all of us to consider, I think, or at least from, from our institution's point of view, it would be beneficial if we can establish some resources or, or put something together that's going to help us on how to leverage these type of tool just for assessment purposes. So just for assessment purposes, the, the, the e-portfolio, how we can benefit uh, at the institution level uh, just to use that as a mechanism to, for assessment. Right. But you have to be careful because, you know, if you end up with 1,400 e-portfolios, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what do you do with that? Right. Um, you have to develop some kind of sampling method or uh, some kind of way in which faculty are not going to feel overwhelmed by it and you'll have the resources to look at them at and, you know, attentively as they deserve. Uh, like I said, we have an FYS course and the college has put in a lot of resources, a lot of time to try to raise our retention and graduation rates. And uh, one thing we did was uh, we built it from the, from the very beginning with the e-portfolio. We thought that stu all students would like the e-portfolio. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, someone I know did a survey in his class where they're using e-portfolio, and some of the responses came back was that were, this is pretty lame. Uh, I, I, I just like to go on Facebook. Uh, because they hadn't yet in this program done more than use it as a repository or a place for students to express themselves. They hadn't really built in outcomes. What are they really looking for in these e-portfolios? Uh, and a way in which to handle them, to evaluate them, or to assess them in a way that's not going to overwhelm, and a way in which they can collect data and interpret it. Is, can I ask, is anyone doing a, doing a lot of e-portfolio work at their college? Actually, I wanted to mention that, uh, excuse me, no, no. Uh, in Puerto Rico, the uh, University of Puerto Rico State University, they have a, uh, a college of education. And the way that they're using ePortfolio is as the main assessment tool for from year one to graduation of the students. So, uh, and, and actually there's a video, if you go to the HEADS YouTube channel, there was a presentation that was done by the director of the program and of the project. It's in Spanish, so so you'll need some translation probably. But it's really good because she goes through the whole process of how they design the, the e-portfolio, how they use it in each course, how they use it uh, through each one of the experiences and the competencies that the students need in order to get that profile of the uh, graduate student that they, they want to the program. It's really comprehensive, it's excellent, and they've done it using uh, uh, Google. As a matter of fact, they, do, they use Google Sites and they have the, the whole template with all the objectives, the goals, everything is, is right there. So students know what they have to do and faculty know what they have to do regarding the competencies within each course that they have to measure and what the student has to do and submit to represent that they met that competency. So it's really good. So you should look at that one. And the other thing is, uh, Richard just gave me a great idea. If we can gather all those uh, newsletters that you write on assessment, we can create this repository within uh, the Virtual Plaza under the faculty development section, and you can all see what each institution is doing regarding what they're doing on a monthly basis or semester basis on assessment. And the other comment that I want to make is that the course that Richard mentioned is excellent for anybody that doesn't know anything about assessment in general education. That's a great starting point. Yeah. And HEDS is often offering that course online. Yeah, it's a self space. You just need to register and that's it. Because it's a self space uh, modality. So you can uh, start it anytime and you have one month to complete it and then you receive 2.0 credit uh, continuing oh, yeah. Yeah. granted by, by HEDS and, and HEDS award. <laughs>
host institution. Is that in the virtual plaza? Yeah, yes. uh, uh, well, it's, it's an individual plaza under world, world, workshops and also through the heads professional development events uh, page. Rest my case. <laughs> we have to know, yeah. even ourselves, we have to know there's so much on the placenta. Okay, Edgar. Um, I know that there's some assessment software. There's assessment software? Yes, we need for gathering and management. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, how useful are they? We haven't purchased one yet. Now, my colleague at Lehman, uh, Ray Galinsky, uh, gave, a, uh, gave a presentation at a CUNY assessment seminar, and uh, he said they're using it rather well. Now, I would suggest that they probably have more <coughs> compliance going on with assessment than we do at the moment. Um, there are many tools out there now. It's become a big thing. Um, I know Ray at, uh, and he would send this to you, Ray at Lehman uh, spent, uh, I think, a few months really investigating them, and they investigated a dozen, and they, as they assessed them according to about 15 different elements, and uh, they decided on tax uh, pastoring, and then Cook's, Cookstown Community College, are you here? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We use track that. Track cat? Track that. Track that. It's like, analyze this. Okay. <laughs> Are you happy with it? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's worked well for us. It's a, it's a, flex, it's a pretty flexible <laughs> system. And, um, you know, back to your point about, your earlier point, that um, it's probably important to get going and then introduce the software instead of the other way around, which we did. In fact, we started uh, asking programs, all, pro all programs are units, academic and uh, instructional and non-instructional, to start keeping track of a set, starting to do assessment, keeping track of it. And we used a, a seven column um, Word document as a, as a template and uh, with the outcomes or goals listed in the methods and the measures and oh, so you on. You and it's a great word. Yeah, I mean, it's just something you created yourself. It's, yeah. And it's a fairly standard approach. And then when we came in with track that, uh, they actually cut it down to four columns. So in some ways, it's like that was an extra benefit. It's like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a real gain because we're going from seven to four. <laughs> um, it's the same information. They just, right. It just right. gets configured a, a little differently. Uh, the other thing about TrackDat, it's, it's a, it's a sta it provides a standardized way of doing it, although TrackDat does work with each institution to do it in a way that's, that fits for the institution. Um, and then it becomes just a series of text boxes, and you, you know, what's your goal? You fill up a text box. Um, and the idea is to, you know, keep it short, sweet, to the point. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, go back and answer a little bit uh, more in full the uh, question you asked about e-portfolios. Um, we are currently in our university <clears throat> engaged in a conversation with CALE, uh, the Council for the Advancement of Experiential Learning, mm -hmm. which is an organization that uh, helps uh, students uh, actually develop portfolios. Mm -hmm and uh, so they actually evaluate also the portfolio. And uh, we're finding that that's a, a, an interesting avenue for us to work with. Um, we're actually doing it system-wide rather than just the university itself, us doing it. What is the university? I'm sorry? New York College or University? Goodstown University. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, we're from the same, oh, yeah, yeah. The same oh, organization, okay. yes. And uh, you know, so, sometimes the faculty have a little bit of a a difficulty with that because they feel that some of the evaluation of the courses, which Gail does through faculty members, experts in the field, uh, is taking work away from them. But uh, we, we're working on along those lines, and I think that was just for those of you who are not familiar with that. That's an interesting uh, way of addressing prior learning experiences yeah. Yeah. through a portfolio. One, one other thing that came up was. Uh, especially for the CUNY people, was the uh, CLA, 
a new uh, tool that's being used as a value-added <coughs> tool. Uh, 100 random freshmen take uh, the CLA, uh, I guess in their first or second semester, and then seniors, or in our case, in community college uh, sophomores, take it again to see value added. Uh, and there were views on that ranging from this is an excellent thing to uh, suspicion. And uh, I know at our school, uh, we got the first results and we didn't expect them to be great. Uh, but we're hoping for an improvement on the second round. I'm not sure if the other CUNY schools have gotten their CLA reports. Anybody want to? I guess I'm just, I'd just like to have one voice on behalf of my faculty and perhaps others that I, I, uh, I'm concerned about, about assessment. They're not assessing anybody in Princeton. They're not assessing anybody in Yale. They're assessing public education for the poorest kids and the least prepared kids as one more distraction to provide a set of metrics in order to rationalize why they want to fund public higher education. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wrong. It's a mistake. Mm -hmm. We're playing into it. The accrediting agencies are wrong unless they apply the same standards to privates, which they're not. And I just think we need to be recognizing the fact that we're starting to spend an enormous amount of money mm -hmm. on administrators and, and we are saying to our faculty, yes, you teach the students, you gave them a letter grade, you assess them. You already assess them. And for me to get into a full rationalization of metric of an average, and I've been president of a two-year college, of an average of a 27-year-old student who's poor, working, married with children, you know the assessment is not going to come out the same as it could who has opportunities to go to a different kind of education. And I think we're playing into something that's costing us an enormous amount of money. It's disrespectful to our faculty, as in our faculty who are teaching faculty, not research faculty, in courses that are being taught by private colleges, by teaching assistants, not by the professors who are in the book. I just think at some point, public education needs to stand up and say, stop it. Either fund public higher education or not, Stop distracting us with this nonsense about assessment. When Venus from Middle States here. Okay, okay. I have two from Middle States. Okay, I made that deal. And we just received our full tenure accreditation. Okay. I'm glad. No, no, let me respond. I'm not in any way representing Middle States here. But we did have that discussion yesterday, actually. We had the president of Princeton uh, with us. Uh, Which has no core courses, right? I agree. Uh, as well as Patricia McGuire, who's the president of Trinity. And we had an interesting debate regarding assessment should institutions not adhere across the board. Uh, and we as commissioners in the, in the commission and the middle states uh, disagree. I think everybody. Uh, regardless of uh, an Ivy League institution or public or community college, private, proprietary, should follow the same system. So uh, there may be different voices, but at least middle states is very firm that every institution has to adhere equally to any assessment regarding the forces and standards that we have. Even though Princeton has no gen ed. They have a different ways to measure, but regardless. I don't, you know, it's not a debate. I'm just saying that there, that, that there is uh, a disagreement about how to assess. Okay. Yeah. Same okay. No, I mean, I, I understand uh, the President's concerns, but I think the issue with assessment of student learning has nothing to do with the arguments that, you, that you've raised. First of all, precisely the idea for assessment of student learning is to understand what are the results of what we do so that we can improve them. Right. Tests don't equivalent, are not equivalent to assessment. You know, when I grade my students on Econ 101, I grade them based on the objectives of the course. And no one in the world is challenging faculty grade. What, what the assessment movement is saying is, as I said before, you claim that you are going to give your students a certain profile, certain particular quality. Regardless of my economic class, that they can move graphs to point on, find an equilibrium point, 
That would not be on a profile of our students, but that would be on my Econ 101 course, and I make sure that they do, and if they don't, they get an F. But what we're trying to say is, what is it that we are after in our bachelor degree, or our associate degree, or training program? This profile is what we are committing to work for, in addition to all the other important content of our curriculum. Now, what we are saying is, you've got to show me that indeed you are providing those experiences. And Gen Ed can be offered in a across disciplines model. It can be offered as separate Gen Ed courses that we all know since you know God created higher education, you know, humanities and social sciences and natural sciences and all. Those are different models of how to do Gen Ed. What, what accreditors say is that everybody should have a liberal component in their education. And, and those examples you gave, they are liberal arts institutions. They're not vocational training schools. And I'm not defending them. We have been very strong with them at the commission, middle states. So the issue with assessment, and, and really we have to get down <coughs> to understand, has nothing to do with evaluating faculty, has nothing to do with questioning grades. Those are beautiful, important components of higher education. It's making a commitment to making sure that those things we say are the trademarks of our own institutions with their you know, branding, that we have procedures, courses, outside co-curricular, extracurricular experiences that will produce that quality. And we're not punished if we are not getting the quality. We are just being told, find out what are you achieving? So that if you're not achieving at the level you expected, you can sit down and improve. That's all. I mean, we're, what this movement wants is to make sure that we're learning organizations. We teach that in Management 101. All organizations should be learning organizations. And academia has wanted to escape that thinking process. So, you know, it's, it's, two, it's two different things, and we should not confuse them, because then we don't help the students. And the goal of this whole movement is to have the students at the center and have all the systems focus on learning and improvement. It's not punishment. It's learning and improvement. And no one gets you know, unaccredited because students only achieve at 40% of what they were aiming at. No one. There has never been an institution that has lost its accreditation because they were underperforming. Everything, all those things can happen. The question is, once you know you're underperforming in an area, then you can act. And evaluation without action is not assessment. It's just one more evaluation. Unless there is change and a you know, process to improve, you have not complied with assessment. So there are two different things. One uh, final question from Antonio. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on the issue of assessment because I look at it as uh, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is that we, we say to our students and we say to society that they have certain skills so they can achieve a certain level. And that based upon what we've given them, they're, uh, they have the knowledge base to, to function in whatever positions they may want to and whatever they do. And, and my concern is that in higher education, we make an assumption that what we're doing, we will continue to do as we're doing. I look at the assessment as uh, allowing us the opportunity to reevaluate those things that we do. And that society changes, uh, that our students have to do change, and our faculty have to be able to assess those changes in society that make this educated individual that we talk about, that we produce. I think too often we stand on historical data and the philosophy that we are higher education, uh, never wanting to measure the relevancy of it. And I think that the relevancy changes, and we should be prepared to change with it. And it's our responsibility to have our faculty uh, assess what they teach and they taught the course in the same way for the last 20, 30, or 40 years. And this is why we do my job, and, uh, and uh, our students are educated. Well, an educated person uh, may be redefined in years to come. 
And we have to be prepared for that. And I believe that we are in a very unique era of technology that is changing the, uh, the types of, of, of skills that will be expected of our students. So that's how I look at it. So I don't look at it as an issue of faculty. I don't look at it as an issue of, of the accreditation body. I think it's an issue of responsibility. And we as educators have that responsibility to change and be flexible. And too often, we've sat there and said, um, we don't want to be questioned. We, we, we've done it this way. Thank you, Tony. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Very good presentation. <laughs>